Praise God who's ready for the scriptures. Uh, We gather in his name to live under his word. Praise God. We put the word above our heads, which means it's more important than what we think. We put the word above our heads, which means it's more important than what we see. We put the word above our heads, meaning it's more important than what we have to say about the matter. (laughs) We put the scriptures high above. The scripture says that he has exalted his word equal to his name. Praise God. So, Father, show yourself mighty and strong by your own speaking. Even as the scripture says, your word strips the forest bare. I pray, let your wind flow through this place. Open our ears and our eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you've followed the Lord for any amount of time, you recognize that as you read the scriptures, you find these little, like, diseases inside of yourself. And then the word injects by the Spirit, The word is injected on the inside of you to take care of that poison. Have you found that in your life? I found this many times in my life, and I'm so grateful that it's this way. The spirit applying the word, the spirit applying the word is injecting the medicine that God himself is to take care of those inward poisons. uh, uh, John Wesley wrote this quote. Listen to this. He said, a thousand apparitions cannot change the heart. Only God applying his word. Praise God. So preaching Christ is proclaiming his person. It's proclaiming his nature. It's proclaiming his heart. But it's also preaching his words, valuing his words. We're in a big delusion if we think that we can love Jesus and separate him from his teachings. (laughs) But to love Christ is to love his teachings. To deny Christ in one sense is to deny his teachings. To deny his teachings is to deny Christ. We look at Christ's words this morning and let them speak to us. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. While you turn there, there's a proverb in Proverbs 22, verse 19. It says, so that your trust would be in the Lord, I've taught you today, which is showing us that the goal of all of Scripture's teaching is to increase our trust in the Lord. All teaching has this end, that we might trust in God. So I intend today to do a couple of things. One, to show that the Bible itself and Christ himself teaches that God wants us, you and me, no one excluded, to be childlike. This is very important to him. Not childish, as 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, as Paul's talking about this, he says, I, when I was, became a man, I put away childish things. We're not talking childish, we're talking childlike. There's a difference because childish is that undeveloped speaking, thinking, and reasoning. That's not what we're talking about. We want to extract today what the Bible teaches, what Jesus is teaching about childlikeness that is given the kingdom of God. So the scripture says here, Matthew chapter 18, it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus You open your eyes in the spirit. You know, when you close your eyes in the natural, they open in the other world. When you're reading the scriptures and you see these things happen. This is why meditation is so important on the scriptures. You look at the scriptures with your eyes open, then you close your eyes and you see it with your spirit, man. And you let the Lord just begin to make that thing alive to you and real to you. So as you close your eyes and you see this, you see Jesus has his men gathered around him. And there's others there as well. And they have this question rising in their hearts. They say, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? (laughs) And he then, this is how he responds. He calls a child to himself. He set him among them. And he said, truly, unless you change and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So whoever humbles himself like this child, he will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're thinking greatness. Jesus is thinking child. They're thinking rank, and he's thinking child-likeness. See, once Jesus perceived in their hearts a looking up for a throne, he immediately performs a sharp course correction by this illustration of grabbing a child and pulling him near. They look up for a throne, and he puts a child on his knee. (laughs) This is God. He's upside down, isn't he? I love it. So in the very face of their aspirations and their ambitions, Jesus, through pointing to a child, exposes 
their limited understanding of divine things. He's basically saying, you guys have no clue what you are doing, thinking, reason. You're out of line with the kingdom of God. And Mark tells the same story, but he's got one difference. He expounds a little bit more with imagery. And Mark says that Jesus calls the child, the child comes to him, and then he holds the child, and he speaks to them while holding the child upon him. Maybe what he's showing by illustration, which I never, I believe that Jesus never did anything arbitrarily. I believe everything he did was calculated and perfect so that he could teach what he wanted to teach. So he's holding a child to talk to them. And in holding this child, I think it exposes the fact that this who's the greatest mentality is destroyed by an image of a child that comes to him and rests upon him. Maybe that question, who's the greatest, is indicative of living distant from the Lord. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the imagery is trying to show us that childlikeness is being focused on the Lord. They're thinking greatest in the kingdom, and he calls the child to look at him. Two different things. Looking for greatness, looking at Jesus. (laughs) Children, look to the Lord. And maybe it is also showing us that we can get too grown up to let him hold us anymore. (laughs) Lord, I got this... uh, I've learned how to do this. Uh, uh, I know how this works. See, the imagery that we see here, to me, is beautiful. Jesus wanting a child to come to him. So, in other words, they're looking for greatness, and Jesus defines greatness as to be with him. He defines greatness as to have him. You know, I feel like the heart, my heart anyways, is very dangerous. It's almost like inclined to self-risings. It's like the human heart quickly becomes self-centered. I look at my heart and I see that if I'm not childlike, I will turn following Jesus into self-exaltation somehow. I see that even in the midst of Christianity, our doctrines, our prayers, and even our worship can be me-centered. And our holy ambitions become about our own attainments. And and then we begin to promote our own legacy or our superiority as spirituality. But this childlikeness is synonymous with humility, Jesus says. Whoever humbles himself like this child, that childlike humility is expressed in coming to Jesus giving Jesus all the attention and letting him hold you. (laughs) To me, the image of letting him hold you is all of trust. Just laying in his arms. I I wrote it down like this. It's being being captured by his charms and enraptured in his arms. (laughs) Praise God. So this humility that we see Jesus is pointing to, he uses this word changed, or in the King James it says converted, This shows us something, that the thinking of ourselves as great or looking for greatness is an unconverted, unregenerate, unspiritual mind. That's what that shows to us. So Jesus is saying we got to get away from that unspiritual, unconverted mind and come into the mind of a child, the child that trusts in the Father. See, grown-ups, those that grow out of childlikeness, They become distant and inattentive to the Lord, and then they don't learn the fear of the Lord. You say, where do you get that from? Well, if you look at Psalm 34, 10, there's this incredible verse, and I think Jesus might be pulling from the Old Testament like he does so beautifully so many times, and he pulls from Psalm 34, 10 that says, come, children. He just called a child to him. Come, children. Then he says, listen to me. That's give me your attention. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I want to learn the fear of the Lord, and I can only learn it from Him. And I can learn only learn it from Him if I'm childlike enough to come to Him. But this shows us that looking for greatness is to not fear the Lord. It shows us that only the childlike learn the fear of the Lord. There are certain characteristics uh, about a, a child that I think are just incredible. They they are. If you've ever watched a two year old or or three-year-old or something, they're incredible beings. <laughs> they're so different than grown-ups. Have you noticed that? 
extremely different. One of the things that really separates them, in my opinion, is, is that they have no thought about where, what they're going to eat or what they're going to drink or what they're going to wear. It's because it's provided for them. This is child likeness. The, the child provides nothing for himself. I ask you, who's the most cared for in your house? Is it not the youngest? <laughs> Who gets the most attention? It's the youngest. And we must trust our father enough to not try to seek these things out ourselves. To not provide these things for ourselves. You can't produce joy. You can't produce peace. You can't produce spirituality or provisions or, or guidance. You can't produce these things, but you can trust your father and he will give them to you and be them for you. Praise God. See, he promises to be these things. So it's so easy. I find in my, my Christian life, it's so easy to grow up into independence. So easy to grow up out of childlike trust into independence that looks for things outside of the Father or looks for things to be found inside of myself. Jesus is the perfect child. He's the child of children when he says, I do nothing on my own initiative and I can do nothing on my own initiative. In other words, he's always looking at his Father. You know, it hit me the other day when Jesus says, I only do what I see and I only say what I hear, that means he's always looking at his father. <laughs> in order to always hear and in order to always see, that means you're always looking and you're always listening. That's childlike. And he's trusting like this. So Jesus says these things and it reminds me of a quote from John Owen. This is masterfully put together. He said, we will have no power from God until we live under the persuasion that we have no power of our own. That's childlikeness. Hannah Whithall Smith in her Christian classic, Christian Seeker of a Happy Life, she says, famine, war, fire may rage around children, but because they are under their father's care, they are unconcerned and they have perfect rest. The chief characteristic of a child is freedom from care. Praise God. John Wesley writes on the same theme. Little children are lowly at heart. They know themselves utterly ignorant and helpless, and they hang upon their father for all their needs. That's the essence, the good part of children, the childlikeness Jesus emphasized. Trust in the one that you love. Trust in me. Love me enough to trust me. This is what I'm seeing here to be one of the major things that we need in our lives. You know, children are also extremely honest. Have you ever seen that before? <laughs> They're brutally honest, almost not even regarded to your feelings. They just tell you what's going on. So children are marked with honesty. That's part of childlikeness. Anybody who wants to come to God dishonestly will never find him. But if you come with honesty, you can't help but see Martha Kilpatrick writes this, there is one human responsibility before God, and it is honesty. She says, God cannot meet with a liar. That's why repentance is necessary, to be completely honest before God. In other words, turning from dishonesty, that's vulnerability. We come before God, we turn from our self-sufficiency, and we turn towards him in complete vulnerability. That's repentance. I turn from self-trust to you. And so we see with this honesty, it is a key to experiencing the Lord. So when they ask who's the greatest, Jesus, with otherworldly wisdom, he responds by calling this child to himself. Praise God. This flips everything on its head. Jesus causes that phrase, who's the greatest? He brings a child there, and then letter by letter, it just dissolves in front of their faces. Wow, weren't we wrong? <laughs> so in Matthew 19, verse 14, the disciples are trying to bring children to Jesus. Or, or, sorry, the, ch the disciples are prohibiting the bringing of children to Jesus. Do you remember this story? Children are coming and saying, no, 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 not the kids, not the kids. But look at what Jesus says. He says, the kingdom belongs to these, these young ones. That trust, that honesty, that coming to him, that attentiveness to him, that lack of selfish ambition, that's the rule of God in the heart because the kingdom of God 
belongs to the children. The kingdom of God is God's rule in the heart. And that rule in the heart belongs to those who are honest, attentive, turn their back on selfish ambition. The childlike, the children receive the kingdom. The Bible says that it is the father's pleasure to give the kingdom to the children. He loves this, which means he will not give the kingdom to any other disposition, any other kind of heart. Maybe Jesus is showing us that adults are irritated by childlike trust. Maybe those that grow out of childlikeness, they are irritated by those who live dependent upon coming to Jesus. Maybe that's what happens with adults when they grow out of dependence and they grow into an independence. Maybe they pride themselves on their independence, the things they're able to accomplish in themselves. Maybe we fall into this trap of no longer being needy. Maybe we fall into the trap of no longer trusting. Maybe we fall into the trap of no longer being honest before the Lord. But I find these things, trust and honesty and vulnerability before the Lord and attentiveness to the Lord and coming to the Lord, these are the childlike things that pull the and attract the kingdom of God and the wonders of the Spirit and the joy of the Lord. They're all connected here. I had a friend, he's from Budapest, and he was at a really restricted church. They wouldn't even clap their hands. They wouldn't take their hands out of their pockets. They were very stoic people, very cold. And, and one, one day he was praying to the Lord in the morning. He said, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes. You got to make me a child, Lord. And, and right then in that service, the children did a play. And at the end of the play, all the children grabbed hands and they began to run around and dance around the sanctuary, around these stoic people. And the Lord says, do you want to be a child? And he says, yes. The Lord says, join the kids. And you know what he did? With tears dripping down his face, he ripped himself out of that pew and he started to dance. He looked like a fool dancing with all these children. But he said that day the Lord broke something on the inside of him. Praise God. So the the incredible thing about children too is they know that they don't have anything. You know what I mean? Everything comes from their parents. They recognize this. One time I, I grabbed my daughter. I scared her. I hid. She came out. I grabbed her and I pretended to be a robber and I said, give me all your money. And she turned around and she looked at me and she goes, Daddy, I don't have any money. <laughs> and it hit me like, like a ton of bricks that, that the reality is, is that I tend to her. I protect her. I'm the one that looks out for her future. I'm the one that gives her all her provision. That's my role as her dad. Why won't I let God be that for me? But, but the reality is, is that when the, when the devil comes to you, if you have something, you're not a child that has nothing. If you're a grown up that has something, then he can rob you. If you, if you have trust in yourself, then he will take you and make you afraid. If you have no honesty, then he'll make you a hypocrite. If you have this attention upon yourself, then what he'll do is he'll make you scattered. If he takes away your dependency from you, then all you have is anxiety. The devil will rob those who don't look to God to be everything. Jesus shows true childlikeness by his dependence on the father. He actually says when the devil comes to him, he says, he has nothing in me. He's got nothing to grab. I have nothing but my father. Praise God. Praise God. I was saying in the first service, there's this incredible passage in the scripture that speaks about the gospel. And when Jesus is being delivered over to death and they strike him and they beat him, they spit on him. You've read this story many times, but there's this phrase in the Bible that jumps out to me and makes me realize what childlikeness is, what true spirituality is. And it is this, he kept on entrusting himself to his father. He kept on. That means every blow. I trust you, Lord. Every spit, I trust you, Lord. Every betrayal, I trust you, Lord. Every area of his life, I trust you. 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 That's genuine spirituality we see in Jesus. Trusting the Father. So much so that you can wash the feet of the one you know who's been stealing from you and will soon deliver you over to death. I will wash your feet. Why? Because I trust my Father. You know, the wonderful thing about Jesus is he never tries to fight for himself or anything. He just trusts his father. That's childlike. It's interesting, too, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, remember the word that he uses to teach us how to pray? He goes, when you pray, say, Father. (laughs) In other words, without a childlike disposition, there's no approaching God. It's Father. 
It's Father. I recognize that I'm your child. This childlike disposition, that's the thing that makes prayer real. Maybe the lack of prayer in our lives is an indication that we've grown up. Maybe the lack of saying, Father, Father, Father. Maybe the lack of fathers in our life, meaning prayer, going up to the Lord, is because we're self-sufficient. We found and grown into a independence from the Lord. So maybe that's the case. But we, we must become like children to approach God. You know, some people try to go into the closet and they wear like a scientist jacket. We're going to figure everything out together, God. And God looks at them and he says, I'm sorry, you're not allowed in here. <laughs> and some people come to God with their business suit on and they come in like, let's just make a deal. Let's, let's make a deal, God. Some people come to God and they've, they're dragging their sword and their shield. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. God says, oh, just, can you just hold on a second? And some people come in there as a professional. I know how to pray. I've learned the methods. I do this. I teach this. But the reality is, is what he's looking for. While all those guys stand there, the man in the scientist jacket, the man in his business coat, the man with his sword and shield, the professional prayer teacher, they're all standing there. And then behind comes a little two-year-old sucking his thumb and he's just messy haired and he's got stuff on his shirt and he just moves, dad? <laughs> and you know what God does? He goes, guys, please scoot aside. I have time with my son. Praise God. That's what God's looking for. No agenda but him. Have you ever had your child come up to you? They're, they're young. They're, super, they're, they're two years old and they're just tired. They just want to come and be with you. There's no other agenda. Seriously, they have no other agenda but just to rest upon you. Man, I wonder if that's the reason why so many people go into the closet and they leave the same way they came in. Because they never laid on him. They never just enjoyed him. You know, one day I asked the Lord to teach me to pray before I went to sleep, and I slipped into a dream. This doesn't happen to me very often. I'm not a prophet. I don't have dreams like this all the time. I said, Lord, please show me, show me what prayer is. Teach me. And in the, in the dream, I, I, I fall asleep, and, and, and what, what begins to happen is I see this, this old Italian cafe with two cups of coffee, and he's sitting on one side, and I'm sitting on the other, and there's nobody else there. It's just him and I. And so I sat down across from him. We both had cups of coffee. He said nothing. I said nothing. We just were aware of each other's presence. And I woke up and I said, Lord, what was that? And I felt like the Lord told me he wanted me to teach you how to pray. I'm like, could it, could it be so simple that all it is is just to be with him? No other agenda. <laughs> so it's important to recognize Jesus calls the children to himself and he lays hands on them and blesses them. I don't think it's out of place to conclude that maybe God's hand passes over those that are too old. They've left that place of dependence and trust. It's also interesting to note that Christ multiplied the food when it was given to him by a child. That's very interesting to me. In other words, he must increase the things surrendered to him in childlikeness. Could it be? Could it also be teaching us that grown-ups have nothing for Christ to multiply? Could it be that adults have too much logic and too much... Uh, could it be that we're unwilling to be child enough to surrender everything over to the Lord? See, Solomon gives us an incredible example in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. He says, your servant, I'm your servant in place of my father, King David, yet I am like a little boy. I do not know how to go out or to come in. In other words, Solomon characterizes his childlikeness by admitting his ignorance and lack of confidence in himself. Childlikeness is habitual consciousness of our insufficiency and a conviction of God's all-sufficiency. That's childlikeness. That's why Jesus says, listen, you ain't got this. You can't even come in. You need this. You need to stay here with me. So we live recognizing that only what God matters, only what God thinks matters. See, logic itself cannot make things happen. We can't manipulate things into being. It is trusting God that produces in our lives. It's only trust in God. As a matter of fact, there's this incredible quote by Andrew Murray, and he says this, the true beauty of childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. I think that's the heart of the issue. 
It's the self-conscious mind and heart and life that just gets in the way of everything God wants to do for you and be for you. But to be childlike enough to give up self-consciousness and trust completely in your father, that's the happiest life there is. Who's the greatest? (laughs) What a question. Who's the greatest? What kind of a mentality is this? Jesus sits there. Who's the greatest, Jesus? And he grabs a child. You know, one time I went to go pick up my daughter from preschool. She was really young at that time. And I I was watching them do the the end-of-the-day pickup. You know, it's the end of the day. Everybody get the toys and put them in the bin. And everybody goes out. It's really funny watching these young kids grab the toys and put them in the the bin. Well, there's one toy left. And the teacher says, there's one toy left. I can see it. And whoever finds it gets a reward. So everybody's looking. The kids are just looking. And finally, this little boy finds the toy, and it's stuck underneath the shelf. So he sees it, and when he starts to walk over to it, another girl sees that he found it and then rushes in front of him and takes the toy out, and she begins to show it as the one who found the toy. So what I do immediately is I look intently at the boy to see what his reaction is going to be. Would he fight for recognition? Would he try to expose her? Would he cower in sadness? What would he do? Well, he threw both hands up in excitement and he screamed, yay! Oh my gosh. He cheered when she stole his glory. (laughs) Why? Because he had a, he had a different goal in view. It wasn't that he would be the one. It would that, it would be that it would get done. Does that, does that make sense to you? You see, that to me is what I want. I saw that, my eyes welled up with tears, and I said, God, make me that boy. Give me that kind of childlikeness. That kind of childlikeness that, that childlikeness that literally is so selfless that it prefers someone else above myself. So I wonder if we've grown up out of selflessness. I wonder if we can recognize today that there's a greater objective than being the winner, being the one that's recognized. Maybe to be childlike means not thinking less of others when you're made higher than them and not envying others when they're made higher than you. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Well, Jesus basically is saying, children don't think like that. You need to become a child. So I thought it was very interesting when I was reading the amplified version of the Bible And in Matthew 18 here, it uses the word forgiving when it talks about children, that children are forgiving. That that touched my heart. Have you ever seen a child literally forgive somebody completely as if it never happened? Man, it moves my heart when I see that. Sometimes our grown-up independence wants to hold on to things against people. We, we, it's almost as if Jesus says, if you want to hold on to things, then you're going to literally be chained to the ground. But if you want to be a child, then you'll forgive everybody. This is precisely why forgiving is the essence of the kingdom of God, because it's childlike. Childlikeness is what Jesus looks for. Another interesting fact is that in Romans chapter 8, the scripture tells us that when the Spirit of God comes upon us, he enables us to pray, Abba, Father, isn't that interesting to you? That, that, that's literally mind-boggling. It, it's not that we receive a new title to, talk, to call God. Like the Spirit comes on us, now we can start calling him Father. No, no, no. The Spirit comes on us and imparts childlikeness by a recognition that we've been born of God and he's our Father and we'll take that place. That's the work of the Spirit in our lives. And when we move out into self-sufficiency, and self-exaltation, we move against, walk contrary to the work of the Spirit in our lives, which is childlikeness and the recognition of the Father. Father is such a wonderful word. It means so much. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther said, nothing makes God's heart race more than when you say, Father. (laughs) Father. Jesus informed them that they had no idea what the kingdom was about. See, Peter, maybe he was the chief speaker and he thought that in the kingdom to come, he'd be the Lord Chancellor or something. He'd be the 
spokesmen of the kingdom of God. Maybe Simon and Jude, who were nearly related to Christ, maybe they thought that they'd become princes because of because they're princes by blood. Maybe Judas held the money bag and he thought in the world to come, he would become the head treasurer of the court of heaven. Maybe Andrew, who's the first one called, thought he was God's first choice. And that was always something that he leaned on. But Jesus, I can see him just shaking his head. And he says, let me get that poison out of your blood. Come here, child. The child removes all of those those things. So lastly here, there's a quote from A.W. Tozer, and it says, God discovers himself to babes. We must simplify our approach to him. We must strip down to essentials. We must put away all effort to impress and come with the guileless candor of childhood. Praise God. The disciples sought greatness, not by character, but by name. Men look to sit on thrones And God wants people to come sit on his knee. An old poet once wrote, it's not as the athlete wrestling for the crown, taking heaven by violence of will, but as a child with your heavenly father, sit down and know the bliss that follows, be still. He came, his arm around me, I leaned upon his chest. I did not long to feel more strong, so sweet the childlike rest. To trust in God. See, children are not seeking perfection. They simply rest in the love of their father. So if you stand with me, let's pray. I need this in my life. How many feel like you need this in your life? Just put your hand on your heart with me and let's pray. Say this with me. Say, God, I recognize that I need a new sight of childlikeness. Will you touch my heart? Will you take the shadows that have crept in? Remove hardness. Remove arrogance. Remove know-it-allness. And make me like a little child. So I can sit at your feet. And worship you all day long. In Jesus' name.